we all know that women and girls throughout the world are treated badly. We all know that throughout human history, an entire half of our society has not been able to fully participate. And we know that we've all lacked and we've all been disadvantaged because of that failure of an entire half of our population participating. We also know when we allow ourselves to begin to hear the stories of the women throughout the world who have suffered, we begin to understand the plight of one in three women and girls who are victims of violence. You as an audience are distinguished. You were invited here. You all are smart. You're well educated. And I know that you probably already realize that by the time I finish this sentence, an underage girl will be forced to marry against her will. By the time I finish my remarks, six girls will be forced to undergo female genital mutilation or female genital cutting. Within the next hour, nearly 30 women and girls will report to police that they have been raped. And by the time you go to bed tonight, 14 women and girls will be murdered because they're considered a dishonor to their family. By this time next year, between 600 and 800,000 people, mostly women and girls, will become victims of the human global slave trade. The subjugation of women is an epidemic of global proportions that leaves no culture or society immune from guilt. We all have a role to play, and women throughout the world, no matter what religion, what culture, or what society have all suffered. We're all handicapped by the lack of equality of women and men, both women and men. And in order to make this point, I want to share with you an analogy that comes from my religious tradition, which is that of the Baha'i faith. Humankind is like a bird with two wings. One is that of the male and the other is that of the female. And until both of these wings are equally strong, this bird of civilization will be unable to soar to its fullest potential will remain handicapped as we have been throughout our history. Through this analogy, you can see a few things. One thing I want you to notice is that we're all attached to the same bird. It's not a women's issue. It's a humanity issue. We are all handicapped and unable to reach our fullest potential. Something else I want you to notice is that if you haven't tried, you actually cannot stick the right wing of a bird on its left side. You can't stick the right wing of a bird on its left side, or vice versa. They are, in fact, unique wings. And they have to be equally strong, though, and equally coordinated in order to fly. But they are different from each other. So we know that the subjugation of women is a huge problem throughout human history. You all knew that already. You didn't need me to make you feel depressed about it or to tell you all of the facts that I just did. So the real question is, what do we do about it? And I think that that is what is the more interesting conversation and what I want to share with you today. Um, there are many things we can do. There are many wonderful organizations and individuals doing incredible things to promote the equality of women and men. But I want to share with you one idea. And the idea is that we have a two-pronged process that we have to engage in. There are two different paths of activities that we have to achieve in order to achieve the equality of women and men. One of them is to promote justice. We have to transform our laws and we have to tr transform our regulations and policies and systems so that they systematically promote justice in our societies. Now, I'm a lawyer and so this is what I work on. I have the uh, privilege of working for the Tahare Justice Center, which is a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services and advocacy for women and girls fleeing human rights abuses. We have offices in Washington, Houston, and Baltimore. And it is our privilege to support the incredible heroic courage of women and girls from around the, cult around the world, from many different cultures who've decided for themselves that they wish to reject the violence that they have suffered, and they come to us for help. We represent women like Fatima, who watched her parents be tortured from the attic where she hid as rebel soldiers came into their home 
and tried to extract from her parents through torture her whereabouts. Unable to take their torture any longer, she made herself known to them. Instead of letting her parents go, however, the soldiers shot them, took her outside, and then burned the house with them in it alive. They took Fatima then to the rebel camp where she was raped, beaten, drugged, and forced to carry their ammunition and kerosene as they went from village to village. We represent young women like Maria, who at the age of 11 came home from school one day to find her mother lying in a pool of blood. She had just been beaten by her longtime boyfriend. And Maria called the police. She reported the crime. She called an ambulance. Her mother was medevaced to the hospital and did survive. The boyfriend was put in prison for three months and then released. And as a punishment for what Maria had done, he very violently raped her. And at the age of 11, she was pregnant. We represent women like Amaya, who rather than marrying the man that she was promised to by her family, decided to marry a man that she had fallen in love with and spent the next 10 years of her life fleeing from country to country because her family viewed the only way to repair their dishonor as her murder. Tahereh has been able to help since our inception in 1997. Over 11,000 women and girls receive justice. We do that with only 30 plus something staff, but we cannot do it alone. We cannot achieve justice with simply a handful of well-meaning people who work for a handful of small nonprofit organizations. We have to be creative and we have to engage the entire profession. We seek to do that in a small way through the management of over 800 pro bono attorneys from 140 law firms who last year donated to Tahereh clients $7.7 .7 million in donated legal services. They helped us in turn litigate over 800 legal matters in that same year which effectively turned every dollar that was donated to us into five of impact. Now, I mentioned to you that there were two different things we needed to do to promote justice and equality for women and men. On the one hand, we have to transform our laws and institutions and society. But on the other hand, we have to actually transform ourselves. Now, transforming ourselves changing our values, changing our cultures, changing our attitudes, our assumptions and beliefs, the stuff we inherited from our families, the stuff that we inherited from our communities and our faiths, that is hard. It's yucky, it's painful, it requires us to look in the mirror. It's hard to develop metrics around, it's hard to know when you're making progress and it's really hard to get a grant for. But this is the stuff that does, in fact, transform us. Some of you may remember that in the 1960s, we had something in the United States called a civil rights movement. It was very successful in transforming the laws and the institutions and society. In fact, the world looks to the US Bill of Rights and many of our Supreme Court decisions as models for how to help eliminate racism. But if you didn't know, or if you haven't noticed, we have not, in fact, eliminated racism. We haven't completely gotten rid of prejudice. In addition to the law, we also have to transform ourselves. We have to transform our minds. When we are engaging in culture change, we have to remember two things. That to want to, to, want to change and to criticize a part of a culture is not a condemnation of the entire culture. Cultures are beautiful, but they may have things within them that could evolve in order to help with the equality of women and men. Another thing we should remember, and this was a wonderful piece of advice that I received from a client with whom I was trying to have a discussion about a particular cultural practice that I knew many people were kind of not wanting to judge because they were wanting to say, well, that's cultural and that's not for us to judge. And she was very upset by this. And she said, you know, as a woman, I have no less of a right to define what my culture means than the men in it. And I think that's very important when we're challenging culture and when we're defining it. Let's listen to all the voices within that culture. I had the opportunity when I was in law school to represent a young woman named Fauzia, who I think exemplifies both the legal change and the cultural change that can occur. 
Fazia was 17 years old when she was forced to marry a 45-year-old man as his fourth wife, and as a condition of the union, she was to undergo female genital cutting. She narrowly escaped the procedure when her sister, just hours before, helped her escape the household. She made her way to the United States, where she sought asylum and was then placed in maximum security prison facilities with American convicted felons and in immigration detention facilities for almost two years while her case was being adjudicated. I had the opportunity as a law student to represent her. I had spent some time in West Africa and I had some understanding and exposure to the ritual that she was fleeing. Fauzia's case ended up being appealed to the highest immigration appellate court and there it received a lot of media attention. And there she won asylum. And her case ended up setting precedent in the United States with regard to whether or not someone can receive protection because of a form of gender-based persecution. Up until her case, our refugee laws did not recognize gender-based persecution as a form of protection. So she helped to change the law. But one day I was visiting her during the litigation of her case in prison. She was beaten down. She was tired emotionally and physically. When she was in prison, she had been tear gassed during a riot. She had been held in solitary confinement for trying to pray before dawn. And she had developed bleeding ulcers as a result of the food that she had been given. She sat across from me in her prison uniform, nearly limp. Her body was bent from the weight of what she had endured. I asked her if she was okay. I knew she wasn't. And she looked at me and she said, you know, nothing will change anyway. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, here I've met other women like me, but women who didn't escape, women who were forced to undergo female genital cutting. And their mothers did it, and their mothers, mothers did it, and their mothers, mothers did it. And it's been going on for thousands of years, and what can I possibly do? because of some of the time I had spent in Africa and also what I had seen, I couldn't exactly argue with her. But what happened in her case was very interesting. The press attention uh, caused a stir in her community. And some people were angry with her for speaking out and airing dirty laundry and maybe perpetuating stereotypes. Others were thrilled that she was finally talking about something that was secretive, but it was causing debate. A Washington Post reporter went to her village after her case was finally won and asked the village chief, what have you learned? And the village chief said, we've learned we have to cut girls younger. <laughs> then there was more debate and discussion. A few weeks later, a New York Times reporter came to the village and she asked the village chief, what did you learn? And he said, I learned we cannot stop debate and discussion and we've decided to stop the practice of female genital mutilation. <laughs> Fauzia had an impact, not only on the law, but on the transformation of her culture and her village. The incredible women around the world who do stand up for justice can, in fact, transform the planet. Now, some of you, I understand, in hearing what I've shared with you may be a little bit uncomfortable. Some of you may want to soon forget some of the things that I've described, but I want to ask that you don't. I want to ask also that you don't become depressed by it, because the good news is that women are standing up, and they are demanding a change, and they are asking for justice. Sometimes the convulsions of the world that are very painful that we're enduring are simply reflections of the progress of change. And we would understand if we had this perspective. I want to ask all of you to just close your eyes for a minute. Close your eyes and imagine that you're not human. You know nothing about the human body, you don't know how it works. You're a Martian. And the Martians have decided uh, to send you here to study us and how we work. And in their wisdom, they decide to beam you as your initial assignment into the middle of a hospital, into the middle of a maternity ward, into the middle of a labor. 
You don't know how the human body works, and what you see may perplex you. It may scare you, it may frustrate you, and you might, in fact, find it disturbing. What you see may include pain, it may include blood, it may include sweat, and it may include tears. What you see may shock you. But if you understand the process, you understand that, in fact, the more intense the pain is, the more frequent it is, the close you are to the birth of something wonderful. And the more, in fact, cause there is for celebration, not depression. Open your eyes. Humanity is currently experiencing the birth pangs of the birth of a new civilization. It isn't pretty, it isn't easy, it isn't well-ordered, but it is inevitable. I believe that in these tumultuous times, we are all witnessing the birth of a new society. I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you for letting me be with you. And most importantly, thank you for all acting as midwives to the birth of the equality of women and men. Thank you.